My name's Nate. I'm one of the pastors on staff. And I want to introduce to you our missionary. This is one of the two of the missionaries we support every month at Peak City Church. This is Gloria Azakiwe. Can you make her feel welcome, Peak City Church? Now... Uh, she and her husband Joshua, my wife Angie and I, we've known them for years, and just they're doing amazing ministry. Currently, they serve the Lord in the kingdom of Eswatini, yeah. uh, formerly known to many of you probably as Swaziland, which if you're looking on a map of the continent of Africa, South Africa, the country in the southern portion of that continent, there is a landlocked country inside of South Africa, and that is, that is Eswatini. Uh, they faithfully minister there. Joshua is uh, basically the headmaster of a Bible college, and Gloria is pastoring a church that they planted there. God is doing great things. She just shared they baptized 13 people last week at church, you know, just before she came to the United States. Um, they have two beautiful sons uh, and we can actually put a picture of the family up there. These boys have grown into men. Look at this beautiful family. Uh, and God is using them to do gospel ministry in a powerful way. And I just want to say it's one of the great honors that we just have as a church to be supportive of a vision that's not enclosed within the walls of the building that we meet in. It's not limited to the community that we minister to. But like we said, and if you've been to Next Steps, which church family, who should go to Next Steps? If you've been to Next Steps, then you've heard that we try to love our neighbor across the street and around the world. And we do this through incredible ministers like Gloria, her husband Joshua, uh, and what they're doing. We support them every month, and that's, that is seed that is sown on good ground. Now, I did not read the introduction that she gave me to read. Maybe I'll do that for the 11 o'clock service. If that was sufficient, give me a little nod, sister. All right, we're going to let Gloria bring the word of God to us today. Would you make her feel welcome as she comes to preach the word here? Thank you so much for being with us today. We love you. Thank you. I really appreciate. Um, it's been a joy and an honor to be a part. I consider myself a part of Peak City Church. Um, thank you, Pastor Nate and Angie, for your friendship, for your encouragement, and for the support over the years. As the Azikiwe family, we honor you. Um, we are, let me begin by reading uh, from the book of Philippians, uh, chapter 3, and then I will make the remarks that I sense God is laying in my heart this morning. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, from verse 1 to 11. Father, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, flawless or faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them my own, I, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Then through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Some years back, uh, years back when we were young, uh, we were playing a game amongst the young adults, and this particular game 
was uh, a game of destruction. Uh, obstacles were put along a path and we were blindfolded and you needed to listen to the voice of your instructor. But then, in the midst of listening to the voice of your instructor, there was a lot of distraction. There was a lot of people making noise, uh, beating uh, drums, and uh, there was just a lot of noise. And so, you had to isolate the voice of the person who was leading you so that when he tells you, lift up your leg, lift it up a little higher, uh, move it forward, uh, step down, you, you, you could follow the instructions to the letter in order to reach the very end of the game. And so I found myself in this situation where there were some who were even trying to mimic the voice of the person who was instructing me. And I had to just keep my focus, isolate every voice. Today, I want us and I want to submit to us that we have been called to have our one pursuit, and that is to know Christ. It means also to know his voice. Paul begins by bringing out a caution. And he begins to, uh, and the first thing I want to focus on is, watch out for those who draw your attention from Christ. Watch out for those who are, uh, have been set upon the path so that you don't focus on the very reason that Christ called you for, and that is to know him. There is no higher, there is no other higher purpose that we live for than to know Christ. And he begins by saying, watch out for the joy stealers. Uh, verse 1, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. The whole theme of Philippians is about joy. You know, he talks about joy. A person, Paul was in prison at this particular point in time. So he's talking about joy. Rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write these same things to you. Rejoice in the Lord. We need to keep our attention on Christ by allowing him to fill our hearts with joy. In a day and age where we are talking about mental health like no other generation before us. In a day and age that there's so much voices, so much distraction, so much noise, so much uncertainty. More than any other time, we are in a generation that needs joy. And Paul begins by exhorting in this chapter, finally my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. I'm reminded of a time when my father came home. Uh, he had been in debt and so uh, unable to pay the debt, auctioneers had come and cleared the, uh, the living room of all the sofa sets and all the, the electronic gadgets that were there and they left. And so the minute my father, he, he's a believer, the minute my father entered the house, I was watching to see how he will react and how this will impact him. And the first thing he did was to lift up his hands and then go like, hallelujah. And I was, that impacted me as a young person thinking, this, there is just tragedy that has happened to us. Our seats have been sold. We are in a crisis. How can you lift up your hands in the midst of a crisis and shout out hallelujah? And then watching him closely, he maintained his joy. He never lost his joy. We are called. We are called to have joy. We are called uh, to, to, to keep our hearts focused on Christ by rejoicing in him. The second thing is in watching out for these things that distract us. Is watch out for false teachers more than any other time. The distracting voices of false and deceptive ideologies. More than any other time, we are living in that generation that is having so many voices that are not the voices of the scripture. A lot of motivational things which are good, they, they, they do their part in lifting our spirits, but they are not the scriptures. And more than any other time, it is so hard to tell what is truth and what is deception? Because deception looks like truth. Paul is clear when he's talking to the Philippian church that were dealing 
with also these people who are coming to tell them, no, 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 you don't need, Christ alone is not enough. You need to be circumcised. You need to follow the law of Moses in order to be saved. And Paul says, no, no, no. <laughs> no, that's not true. It is your faith alone in Jesus Christ that keeps you on the path of salvation. You don't earn salvation through works. You earn salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And then he continues and he goes on. One, another aspect of uh, watching out for the distractions is watch out for identity stealers. Hold on to your identity in Christ. False teachers draw your attention. False teachings draw your attention away from Christ. But Paul is exhorting and telling the believers, it is we who are the circumcision. We who worship by the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. Because we worship him in spirit, then we are the ones who are genuinely known by the Lord himself as his own. Watch out for those who draw your attention away from Christ. And then he goes on to talk about putting your confidence in Christ and not in yourself and not in anything that pertains to your life here on earth. Put your confidence in Christ. He goes on to say, we put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, Paul goes on to give his impressive resume. <laughs> impressive, impeccable in terms of righteousness. Amazing CV. <laughs> and he goes on and he, after he's done all that, he says, I put no confidence in the flesh. No confidence in his background. He talks about being circumcised on the eighth day the, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. These things mean something to the Jews he's talking to. They mean something. And is he boasting? Yes. He is. And why is he boasting? To show them. That really, if there's anyone who has a reason to boast in the flesh, in achievements, in my work, in everything, in my background, it is me. But then, he says, do not put confidence in your background. Do not put confidence in your achievements. Do not put confidence in a day and age where it means something. I had my credentials. Maybe we shall read them. <laughs> but do, do, Paul here is exhorting. Yes, you may have your resume. You may have your credentials. You may have your achievements. You may have things to boast about in your background. But don't attach and hold on to these things so that they define you. Because you are a child of God. Paul goes on to say, I count all these achievements. All these things in my background. I count them as loss for the sake of of Christ. Verse 7, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. My impressive resume, my impeccable righteousness as the law is concerned, all this that I bring to the table, I consider loss. I consider loss for the sake of Christ. Put your confidence in Christ. Not in yourself, not in your background, not in your achievements. Put your confidence in Christ. And then when he has set this foundation, 
is when now he zeroes in. Make knowing Christ the supreme desire and pursuit of your life. Do not count these things as anything except for loss for the sake of Christ. So what do you do? Consider everything loss compared to knowing Christ. Paul goes on in verse 8. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Surpassing greatness, my God, of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. So our backgrounds, our impressive backgrounds, our degrees, our accomplishments, our achievements our bank accounts, our possessions, the things we care most dearly about, your children, your spouse, your family, all these things are good in themselves. But Paul says, mm -mm, they won't define me. Knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord, personally, and intimately is the greatest thing in the world. And Paul has no regrets to say, eh, 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 I'll push these things aside. Because my pursuit is to know Christ. You know what our problem is <laughs> in our time globally? Not just here, <laughs> even in Africa. Our problem is we want to gain Christ without losing anything. We want Christ together with so that we are defined by Christ and. But hear me, when you get married and you zero in on your spouse, do you continue dating other people? When, okay, let me go slowly. <laughs> when athletes are traded from a team to another team, do you still play? Do you play for both teams? How is it that we have embraced Christ? And Christ and this is what I this is what I boast in. My identity is first tied to my achievements, to the degrees that I have acquired, to the success in business or climbing up the career ladder. It, it, to, why, why is it that we hold to the same standard? Christ. And Paul says, and be found in him, be found in Christ, having the righteousness that comes by faith. So how do we consider all these things a loss? Putting them aside and desiring, desiring to be found in Christ, to be found in Christ. To become like him in his death. To participate and share in his sufferings. Wow. <laughs> I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. And becoming like him in his death. So somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. It doesn't, this power that is made available is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. So that when you are weak, you are strong. But we are also called to participate in the fellowships of his sufferings. So that we know more than any other time, let me just prepare us as a church. 
more than any other time, the Christian, genuine Christian, will be hated. Jesus said, if they hated me, they will hate you. They will hate you because of your connection to me. More than any other time, Christianity is soon going to be a minority that is hated. So that when you stand for your Christian faith, you think people will applaud you. No, no, no. They will actually hate you because of your Christian faith. I think that is becoming a reality in our day and age. And so Jesus is saying, Paul is saying that I want to participate in the fellowships of his sufferings. He was rejected. Can we expect to be rejected? He was crucified. We are called to die daily. We are called, Jesus said, whoever comes after me must first deny self, pick up his cross and follow me. A lot of us and too many of us want the power, but we don't want to die. We want the wonderful things that the gospel holds out for us, but we don't want to pay the price for it. We don't want to allow God to work. We don't want to allow God. So we are hanging on to Christ and Christ and a story is told of this five-year-old boy. They went to the beach with the parents and he was collecting very small, tiny shells that could fit in his arms or in his little hands. And so as he collected and collected, uh, soon his hands were filled with shells, many small shells that could actually <laughs> fit in his small fists. And then as they kept walking, they came across a beautiful big shell. And the boy tried collecting it with his hands. <laughs> and the parents were like, you can't pick it up. You have to let go the little shells you have in your hands so that you can pick up this big one. A lot of times, we don't want to let go the little shells that define us. We don't want to let go the little shells so that we can pursue Christ which is a bigger purpose than anything else we can pursue in this life. What are your 20 small shells that are hindering you? That are making it hard for you to let go? Let go so that I can pursue Christ. I can pursue him. Will you let go of your attachment to these things? Will you let go of the hold that these things have in defining you and saying, I'm content to be a child of God? During COVID, we had just moved in to Eswatini as missionaries. And we moved in in 2020, January, end of January, had February to just try and settle in and then shut down. Happened. Everything came to a standstill in the month of March and subsequent months it was just in and out of lockdowns. I remember, and I think many of us may have gone through this, all of a sudden, the things that defined you, the things that made you feel important for me, the things that defined me, the things that made me feel important, the things that made me feel like I was somebody, I no longer could do them. I went into a crisis of trying to figure out, so am I still, is there still worth in anything that has to do with me? When I'm no longer getting invited, when I long, no longer have a church because we just moved in before we did anything, there was lockdown, so I, we couldn't start a church. The, all the things that defined me were shut down. And it's like God picked me and put me in the shelf. It was then that I began the process 
of soul searching and asking myself, surely, how did I get here? How did I get to a place where my achievements became my identity? My work became my identity. How did I get here that the church relationships and everything that gave meaning and purpose to everything that I was doing, finally when it is shut down, I feel like a nobody. It took a while. I remember 2020 into 2021. Wondering, what, where do I begin? How did I get here? As I began to search the scriptures afresh, realizing how far off I had moved from the mark, so that when everything else was shut down, everything that my feet stood upon that was sinking sand, all sank me down. I realized I had been so off. I began the journey to recapture my faith in Christ. If there's anything like that, I don't know. <laughs> to recapture my faith in Jesus Christ. I began the journey to search the scriptures, to realign myself with the Lord and say, Lord, when you remove everything, when everything is taken away, the things that I hold so dear are taken away. I want to be found in you. I want to be known by you. I want to be in a place where you are my highest pursuit. There is nothing greater. It is then that recovery began. So that now when I see all these things that are happening, all these achievements, all these things, they are on the side. The focus now is Christ. He is my identity. He is my identity. He is my highest pursuit. And today I just want to invite us to consider is there anything in your life that is drawing your attention away from Christ? Is there anything? Any distraction? Any noise? Anything that is drawing away your attention from Christ? For the Philippians, it was the false teachers. For us, it could be anything. It could be a present relationship. It could be that you're holding on to the past. It could be worry, fear, and anxiety, especially with the way our world is today. Whatever it is, let me encourage you, fix your eyes firmly on Jesus Christ. Guard against anything that will draw your attention from Christ. In what are you placing your confidence in? Is it in the politics of the day? Discouraging as politics across the world is. Is it in the politics? Is it in the politicians? Is it in governments? Is it in your business or whatever it is? Is it in your achievements? All other ground is sinking sand. Place your confidence in Christ. Fix your eyes on Christ. And the last question is, do you want to know Christ more than anything? More than anything. Is he worth, is he worth your highest pursuit? Is he worth everything? Is he worth or is it Christ and? I'd like to invite Pastor Nate to close for us. Is it Christ and? Let's reflect in that moment. 
Is the sole pursuit of your life Jesus? Or is it something else? Or even that powerful word that says, is it Jesus plus? Friends, you, we, listen, Satan roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he, he may devour. And one of the ways that he takes cracks at the armors of Christ's followers, especially those that have much, is this idea of it's Jesus plus. And I don't want to re-preach this sermon. You let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. 